Back in mid-July, Dylan Burns appeared on the show Onion Nuggets to, among other things, debate America's involvement in the ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. Just in case you don't know, Dylan Burns is an independent journalist currently on the ground in Ukraine. Dylan's politics are mostly left-wing, but he strongly supports the U.S. Army of Ukraine. Onion Nuggets is a show hosted by TJ, the Amazing Atheist, his friend Paul, and TJ's younger brother Scotty, though Scotty wasn't present for this episode. These guys strongly oppose the U.S. sending military aid to Ukraine. Those of you who regularly watch me know that I am very much with Dylan on this. Links to portions of the debate are in the description box below if you want to watch for yourself, which I recommend you do. Obviously, I'm biased, but I think Dylan had the upper hand. He definitely demonstrated that he was more knowledgeable on the subject, something that TJ and Paul granted him. Their defense is that they never claimed to know the specifics of the conflict better than Dylan. They simply have greater wisdom on matters of foreign policy thanks to their lived experience. Unlike the 22-year-old Dylan Burns, they have seen American militarism before, and they're familiar with its consequences. I think that Dylan is uh, pretty bright and seems to understand this uh, situation pretty well. But Definitely I think, from a political perspective right, better than right. we do. Oh, yeah, 100%. Like, he's obviously more knowledgeable. Blatantly so. And But, like, the, the thing is, I just think that uh, he hasn't been around the block enough times. I'm going to play the uh, experience card. Be like, he's, he's just young and naive. I'm not going to play the age card, but I do think that lived experience is important in, in the development of one's kind of worldview and expectations for an event. Sure. And I do think that a lot of people, maybe not Dylan, I'm not, and, and I don't really think, look, it happened to me. You know, I didn't always have, at Dylan's age, when I was Dylan's age, I didn't have the same politics that I have now. I was a much more standard, dyed-in-the-wool kind of Democrat, pro-American voter guy back when I was 21, 22 years old. And it was through years and years of being outright lied to by my government about their intentions in these various different countries and the quote unquote freedom fighters that live in them that eventually become terrorist scumbags that we're going to smoke out of their holes. It is through year decades of lived experience that my position is what it is now. And I do think that that creates a gap between Dylan and I. This is a ridiculous thing to say for a number of reasons. First of all, unchecked by knowledgeable critics in real time, these guys have been perfectly happy to make specific claims about the nature of the conflict that would presumably necessitate such knowledge. You can also see in this map what Russia's real uh, goal is. So down below is the Crimean Peninsula, mm -hmm. which Russia annexed with little to no fucking resistance from the international community, by the way. When was it? Back in like 2009 or 10 or something uh, like that? 2016 or something. Was it later? Yeah, later? Okay. That was like um, 16 or something. And you can see it kind of just hangs out there if all of the red that has been taken over by Russia is Ukraine. If it's Russia, they have a land route to that very important port. And thus, they've secured the, the ability to, you know, just like transfer goods in and out of the country, do more commerce. It's easier for them to do. That's what it's about. It's about money. Yeah, and it's about you know, securing a route to the sea that's unopposed by a country that you're you're bellicose with. Uh, so the ultimate, I mean, if Russia can take this whole f***ing shebang, she will. I don't know why she's a girl. I don't, even, sudden, I, don't but, think, I don't even think I don't even think Putin I, I, wants it. I think I think yeah. I, mean, I think that Putin's does. I mean, I think that if she can have it, she'll take it. But I think that what she really wants is this. <laughs> she wants this big old chunk right here. Yeah, she wants a land bridge to the Crimean Peninsula, <laughs> so that there's nobody that can oppose Russia's movement of military troops and goods and services in and out of that Black Sea port. That's it. That's what it's about. It's money. It's only when face-to-face -face with someone who knows the situation better than they do 
that they retreat to this, I don't know the specifics, but I see the bigger picture, stance. Second of all, Paul and TJ are both YouTube old timers. I've been watching them both for over 15 years now, when they were much closer to the age that Dylan is now. And they've been saying the exact same stuff the entire time. Their position is not the function of some wisdom they've gained through experience, it's the Dunning-Kruger effect. They think they have it all figured out because they know so little. They saw folly in the War on Terror during their formative years, which there was plenty of, I certainly don't deny that. And now they think they have American foreign policy figured out. The thing is, your age doesn't matter. It's about your arguments and the evidence you present to support them. I can find plenty of people who are older than TJ and Paul who agree with Dylan. That doesn't mean anything. With that said, Paul and TJ did bring up two things that everyone who is in favor of sending military aid to Ukraine must consider. First, there is the undeniable fact that there are enormous human costs, what we euphemistically call collateral damage, to the United States arming various groups throughout history. Why, why, why does weapons seem odd? Um, because you just, you, you don't, you don't know where those weapons are going to end up. You don't know if you're, I mean, like, let's say you arm Ukraine, Russia wins, Russia takes over. You just armed Russia, especially when you're talking about sending like jets. I mean, the, 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 I'll take this a step further. I, mm -hmm. I, I would, I, you know, I don't know this for an absolute fact, but I would bet, you know, my salary for a year that Ukrainian people have already been I'll killed. Take it. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll bet it to TJ <laughs> that Ukrainian people have already been killed by weapons that were sent to Ukraine and seized by Russians. Oh, I mean, that's pro almost certainly true. But I mean, that's true of any weapon shipment to any country, period, in any war. Which like, is, weapons, well, that's, that's one well, of the reasons for, why I oppose it. They also brought up the realities of limited knowledge and externalities. That your political calculations are probably mostly correct. On this, I feel like most of what you've said is cogent and makes perfect sense. But I also think that in war, these sorts of predictions have a tendency of not working out, blowing up because a lot of people, a lot of times, like people sit there and, oh, yeah, I, well, you know, this, the, the geopolitical situation on the ground is this, and they're not going to be able to sustain this war effort for this amount of time. We're going to do this and that. But there's so many. X factors. There's so many black swans. There's so many things that could happen that no one fucking sees coming. So many surprises that I it's mean, impossible to like just predict what the the larger result makes. So this is true of anything in life, right? You yeah. throw a rock into the the pond. There's ripples, mm -hmm. and like you don't necessarily know what those ripples are going to do, where they're going to go. And I think that before you take any action, especially an action as provocative as throwing a bunch of weapons on a geopolitical conflict, you might want to really be f***ing careful about that. Like, intensely careful. Given that we cannot know how things will inevitably end up, shouldn't we defer to not sending dangerous weapons around the globe? Of course, every action is made with limited knowledge. So too is the case with choosing not to act. And since we don't know what the outcome would look like had we done things differently, we're inevitably stuck with a counterfactual. We similarly don't know what the results of a conflict would be if the United States sat on the sidelines. And it's certainly conceivable that there are scenarios where there would be less suffering and bloodshed. A lot of people argue that this is the case with the Rwandan genocide where, instead of conducting a humanitarian intervention, the U.S. sat idly by when hundreds of thousands of Tutsis were slaughtered with machetes. But again, we'll never know. Limited knowledge applies to domestic policy as well. We don't know what all the effects of a given government policy are going to be. And while the stakes aren't always life or death, people's well-being can be significantly impacted with government policy. But, as we all know, there are costs to the government not intervening in domestic affairs as well and the balance sheet as to what the correct course of action is will always rely on counterfactuals. And while it may seem callous to put human lives on a balance sheet, such calculations are inevitable. This doesn't stop most people, with the exception of anarchists, from categorically rejecting any government action in domestic policy. I don't see why TJ and Paul think this ought to be the case with foreign policy. With all this in mind, let's talk about Afghanistan, a subject that was inevitably brought up. This is one of the things that I get for when I bring it up. Uh, I'm not trying to claim that the political situation is the same, but I think that there are a lot of comparisons to be drawn in uh, Afghanistan.
for the uninitiated, in 1979, Russia invaded Afghanistan to help prop up the pro-Soviet socialist government, which was struggling to control the country. Seeing an opportunity to hurt their great rival, the U.S. decided to play the other side of the board. Over the course of the 10-year war, the United States sent over $20 billion, that number is not adjusted for inflation, to the Pakistani intelligence agency, the ISI, who in turn sent weapons and funds to various groups who opposed the socialist government. This was known as Operation Cyclone. Zvigny Brzezinski, Jimmy Carter's national security advisor, famously said of this operation that the United States could make Afghanistan Russia's Vietnam. As was almost always the case during the Cold War, it wasn't just the U.S. aiding the Soviet's enemies. But that's another topic for another day. Anyway, initially Operation Cyclone appeared to be a success. The Soviet Union got bogged down in a costly war for 10 years. This played a pivotal role in the dissolution of the USSR. Of course, the story doesn't end there. After the Soviet withdrawal, the various factions which fought the socialist government descended into a civil war. And in the end, the theocratic Taliban took power. This wasn't just miserable for the people of Afghanistan. The Taliban famously harbored Osama bin Laden after he was expelled from Sudan. It was in Afghanistan that he and his terrorist organization, Al-Qaeda, planned the 9-11 terrorist attacks. Of course, that led to the American invasion and occupation of Afghanistan, which lasted 20 years and is pretty much universally viewed as a failure. Sadly, once again, Afghanistan is mostly under theocratic control of the Taliban. While Afghanistan has always been a rough place, especially the countryside, where certain tribes observe a literal fighting season, you can make a credible case that American involvement, on the whole, has made things worse. And here's where TJ and Paul talk about the balance sheet because the downsides of American involvement are obvious. Civilian casualties are the most obvious example. This goes hand in hand with some pretty awful people commandeering American weapons. This is one thing that the boys over at Onion Nuggets like to bring up a lot. This is a little overrated. American arms oftentimes require specific parts to use and upkeep as well as specific training to operate, both of which are pretty difficult for the Taliban to acquire, but point taken all the same. A lot of weapons U.S. tax dollars purchased were turned on innocent Afghans. And, as if that wasn't enough, the U.S. is haunted by the ghost of Christmas past in the form of collapsing towers. Allowing this country to descend into civil war begat a favorable state to Islamic fundamentalism which begat Islamic terrorism aimed at the United States and others. This is all a gross oversimplification, but it's worth bringing up. So that's the negative side of the ledger. Again, we'll never know what would have happened had the U.S. not done Operation Cyclone, but there were undeniably negative consequences from it, and these cannot be ignored or dismissed. But what about the positive side? Is there one? Well, I would argue that the dissolution of the Soviet Union is a good thing, which the Afghan war was in no doubt a contributing factor. But more importantly, in my opinion, was how Afghanistan contributed to the peaceful dissolution of the Soviet Union. 1989, the year that the USSR left Afghanistan, was also the year that the Berlin Wall fell. While this wasn't the end of the Cold War, nor the end of socialism in Russia, nor the end of the Soviet Union, the wall falling was the beginning of the end of all three. What was so remarkable about the fall of the Berlin Wall, and all the protests in Germany that coincided, as well as the migration from the Eastern Bloc countries that fomented it, was that the Soviet Union didn't crush them. If we're talking about historical probabilities, you would have guessed otherwise, as the Soviet authorities had traditionally responded to uprisings with violence. The Hungarian Revolution of 1956 was the first major episode of resistance in the Eastern Bloc. The revolution was initially started by students protesting the government's dominance by Moscow until it spread throughout the country. That was, until the Soviet Union rolled tanks into Budapest, crushing any resistance to the pro-Soviet government. In 1968, activists sought to strengthen civil liberties in Czechoslovakia and what was known as the Prague Spring. Protests and talks lasted for over seven months, until the Soviet Union occupied the country with 200,000 soldiers, killing any remaining resistance. In the 1980s, the Solidarity Movement started gaining steam in Poland. Solidarity was an anti-Soviet trade union movement in which workers protested for better conditions and social change. While the Soviets never sent tanks into Warsaw, they convinced their puppet, Polish dictator, Wojciech Jaruzelski, to implement martial law. 
He was granted assurances from Moscow that, should things get ugly, they would have his back. This was almost certainly a hollow promise, as we'll see, though Yurizovsky didn't know that at the time. He believed it because previously, the Soviet Union was perfectly happy to use violence to keep its empire intact. This was essentially the same situation in Afghanistan. A socialist, pro-Soviet government on Russia's border, in this case the South, not the East, was in jeopardy. So the Soviets decided to intervene militarily. Of course, unlike the countries of the Visegrad group, Afghanistan was a little more difficult to bring to heel. Afghanistan has the advantage of a menacing geography. Its mountainous regions make it much easier for guerrillas to fight and hide, which is exactly how the Afghans fought the Russians. Furthermore, the country is far less urbanized, with the countryside being particularly hostile. There's a reason why the people who occupy this space cast off Alexander the Great, the British Empire, the Soviet Union, and, dare I say, even the United States. And make no mistake, the disastrous quagmire that was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan was in no small part a significant factor in why the Soviet Union decided not to stop the uprising in Germany. This was much to the surprise of the Soviet forces stationed there. When protesters outside of the Russian embassy in Dresden started to get more and more aggressive, the commanding officer, a KGB agent named Vladimir Putin, called the capital for help only to get no response. Moscow was silent, they said. Initially, crushing the protests was considered, but the top brass kept repeating one word when considering rolling tanks into Berlin, Afghanistan. As Viktor Sebastian writes in Revolution 1989, the fall of the Soviet Empire, there was one overriding reason why the Red Army tanks were not sent to Warsaw to suppress the Solidarity Movement. It was explained by Mikhail Suslov, perhaps the most hardline apologist for Russian imperialism in the entire Moscow leadership. We simply cannot afford another Afghanistan. He said when Soviet magnates agonized over what to do in Poland, Poland was the first crack in the facade. And that agony only increased when East Germany started to rattle. It's funny because when the Berlin Wall fell, you'd think that Washington would have been thrilled. But this wasn't the case. President George H.W. Bush was extremely concerned about what this momentous event might bring forth. He saw tensions in Yugoslavia during his presidency as well. And all the violence that came with that. Most notably, there was the Bosnian Genocide. Another episode of mass death where the U.S. stood idly by. For what it's worth, this inaction also fueled Islamic extremism. As Muslims around the globe watched as the West did nothing to prevent the slaughter of their fellow Muslims at the hands of Orthodox Serbs. This is actually what radicalized Majid Nawaz. After the Bosnia Genocide in Europe and facing some severe domestic racism at home, violent racism, and harassment from the police authorities as well. Um, I went through a process of recruitment. Some ideological recruiters from a group known as Hizb al-Tahrir recruited me, and I spent uh, the better part of the next decade, my teenage years up until 24, uh, proselytizing for a global caliphate. This demonstrates that there are indeed externalities to inaction as well. Bush and his team were concerned that the dissolution of the Soviet Union would be this, at a larger scale, and with nuclear weapons. Fortunately, the Soviet Union did not follow the same path. As Peter Conradi wrote in Who Lost Russia, the relative bloodlessness with which the Soviet Union dissolved was remarkable, especially compared with the series of wars that followed the breakup of Yugoslavia which took place around the same time. Both countries were home to a patchwork of different ethno-nationalist groups, with age-old grudges against one another and potential territorial disputes that had been suppressed during the decades of authoritarian rule. Russia dominated the Soviet Union economically and politically to an even greater extent than Serbia dominated Yugoslavia. A large number of Russians, like Serbs, lived outside the borders of their home republic. Slobodan Milosevic, the Serbian and later Yugoslavian leader, exploited this situation with his drive to create a greater Serbia, with disastrous consequences for his own country and its neighbors. While it's impossible to prove a counterfactual, we do have a natural experiment here. Two large, multi-ethnic states breaking apart, one with an orgy of violence, while the other one with very little bloodshed. Even if you look at the whole Eastern Bloc, which the Soviet Union dominated, communist governments dissolved relatively peacefully, the one notable exception being Romania. I would never say that this was entirely due to Afghanistan. It in no small part happened because of the restraint exercised by those in leadership positions, notably Mikhail Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin. But we do know it was a factor. The peaceful breakup of the Soviet Union is just taken for granted at this point. But it was far from inevitable. And that's definitely one point that belongs on the positive side of the Afghanistan ledger. And therefore, one point in favor of American intervention. Mm -hmm.